done it, they run it in the server. Month. <laughs> I never, I never look there. It, it, it's it's, the, it's this fun. computer I installed Kapersky and it it um, for some reason it's it's in, I got to uninstall it. It's, it's causing trouble. Okay, here we are back for part two. I see Andres here, Circle Legal Trust, mm -hmm. Las Vegas annual convention. How you doing, Andre? Can you hear me? I hope. Uh, I can hear you fine, Mike. I, I'm just going to post this link on the event page so. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go ahead and notice Mike Iwasaki because he's going to speak as well. And I just sent an invitation to Eric. You have to send that invitation to everybody? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'll send you another one, Dan. So we're just standing by here, Andre, waiting for people to get in. But uh, you know, Andre, uh, Iwasaki's really done some some amazing stuff with twenty four seven, and uh, you know, even with the no follow, it's going to be pretty incredible as far as. Um, the semantic web. If you get your article on Associated Press, you're going to get some serious exposure for your brand. Okay, Mark, um, go ahead, and I'll just turn the, my computer around so everybody can see you. Okay. All right. Where were we? <laughs> um, you want? Uh, right, let's go. You know what? We're going to put you on Dan's computer. Okay. Okay. Pretty good. All right. Uh, I'm just trying to remember where we're at. <laughs> we were talking about content curation and uh, yeah. how you felt about that and some of the concerns. Right. The concern is that. Uh, these things, some of these things like Scoop It, uh, Triber, some others like that, um, it could be seen at some point as uh, kind of almost like link rings. Uh, if there's a lot of mutual sharing, go, too much of that going on back and forth, and especially I became concerned with that when Scoop It uh, started making its links follow, uh, that you know at some point, uh, this you know this might be just paranoia, but at some point. I could see Google, you know, turning a hairy eye on something like that, um, especially if there's too much, uh, it, you know, mutual mutual sharing gone. If it has, starts having the appearance of, it's like, you know, I'll share your links if you share my links, kind of situation. So okay, they just take that with, you know, grain of salt. That might be my current Google paranoia, but, um, I'm, you know. I, that's that's my one concern or caveat really about those. If you go into them, you know any of these kind of curation uh, networks. If you go in them, I think with the main goal of building uh, building traffic, uh, that kind of thing, then you know I think that's that's great. That that's okay. Um, I would just caution anybody about getting into any kind of uh, agreements, even if you think they're behind the scenes. Where you're saying like you know hey you know if you exchange my links or you 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 share my stuff I'll share your stuff anything like that that might over time start to develop a pattern that would be discernible is uh, might be might be cause for concern. Any other uh, any other questions? Does anybody have any questions for? Uh Mark Trackhaven about any social media type stuff. I've, I've got a question. Sure, Andre. Um, Mark, just with regards to your article on the authorship apocalypse, I know it's quite a few months ago. Mm -hmm. but if you can just talk about that for a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. All right, great. Yeah, what's happening with uh, with Google authorship? I know that's a topic of interest to a lot of um, uh, a lot of attorneys um, because 
you guys want to be known for your name. You want to be known for your face. Uh, and just to, to try to cover uh, quickly a little history here, uh, in, back in October of 2013, uh, Google's Matt Cutts announced at PubCon in Las Vegas that uh, now almost two years into the Google authorship experiment, Google was going to begin to cut back on the amount of authorship-rich snippets that it shows in search. By authorship-rich snippet, we mean that uh, author photo next to, the, next to your content in search results, with your byline name, and sometimes your, your, a link to your Google Plus profile with uh, your number of followers on it. Um, that, in certain verticals, uh, and I think we think this is what might have prompted it, um, you know, lawyers, uh, real estate agents like this, um, were perhaps abusing, or from Google's point of view anyway, abusing the, uh, the privilege, as it were, by you know, wanting to get their face on everything. Google really intended authorship to be a way of identifying this is, you know, this is a real piece of authoritative content authored by a real person. And, and for people that you know, would trust that, when they looked at search results, they would see a, a real face and say, oh, I'm going to get a real piece of content here. But in, in too many cases, people were just putting it on everything. So you know, real estate agents would have it on, on house listings. Uh, so you'd see, you know, you'd see uh, 123 Wacker Drive uh, for sale as a search result, and there's the smiling real estate agent's face next to that. Now, of course, he loves that. He wants that there. Um, you know, you guys and, and real estate agents are two of the people most, more than anybody else, probably understand the power of that. And that's why you, you put your faces on all everything, you know, on billboards, on shopping carts, on, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. So... Um, it was understandable, but it wasn't what Google intended for it. So they began to they began to cut back, and we saw in December of 2013 we saw a pretty significant dip. Um, depended on the query, but on some queries, you know, 10-15% uh, or more reduction in the amount of authorship snippets that were being shown. And what I did was I at that point launched a, a major study where I accumulated hundreds and hundreds of uh, author profiles, spent uh, a month looking over them in great detail, looking at, looking for people that had not had any change, you know, that were getting authorship for most of their content before December, were still getting it after. Some people who had lost some, but not all. Uh, there was a new, whole new class that we saw emerge. In fact, I called it first class, second class authorship because we were seeing now that some people were still getting an authorship result but no, with no photo, just their name. So it would say, you know, underneath the title of the search result, it would say, you know, buy Mark Trapping and buy Michael Oiline. Uh, and so I call that a second-class uh, authorship result. And some people lost it all together. And uh, what we saw, and again, I'll, uh, I'll send Michael the, uh, the link for this uh, after I get off here so he can share it around. Uh, I published an article on the Stone Temple site um, called "The Great the Google Authorship of um, Kidnapping," and I wrote the article kind of almost like a uh, forensic investigation. And what we found, just to give you the the TLDR on that, was the number one factor still was and remains to be um, site related or publisher related in Google parlance. So. Uh, we see a lot of people who, you know, didn't lose all their authorship snippets. They lost it for some sites and not for others. Uh, we don't know all the factors, but, uh, you know, the overall quality, which is always an ambiguous statement of the site, but uh, things like its, um, its, you know, how much history does it have with Google, uh, the quality of its, of its link profile. Uh, but even things like recently we discovered, uh, uncovered that something like site speed, site load speed, Affect it. We've we had a number. These are all anecdotal, but they were enough to get my attention. That where people lost their authorship snippets, uh, we noticed that they had really bad site load speed. They took measures to improve that, and when they got their site load speed significantly improved, lo and behold, a day or two later, their uh, authorship snippets started showing again. So it can be all kinds of things like that. Uh, one of the big factors that we've tested and noted, is uh, avoiding site-wide authorship, like putting one person's authorship on everything on the site. Google always said they didn't want you to do that, but now they, they're enforcing it. So 
uh, you want to only have authorship connected to actual content pages, pages that really have some substantive content on them. Uh, something that we would, you know, any of us would look at and identify, oh, that's an article. Uh, if I saw it in a newspaper or, an art or a magazine, I'd recognize that's an article. It's not an ad. It's not a product listing. It's not an about page. Uh, so those are some of the factors that we that we saw uh, were a determining factor as far as... Is it, did I cover Mark, what... Mark, Mark, really quick, are you suggesting that we shouldn't have... Are you suggesting that we shouldn't have the... Uh, the authorship snippet in our footers? Yes, I'm suggesting that very much. Uh, headers, footers, get out of there. You only want it on the individual pages. So uh, there's there's two ways of doing that. I mean, the, the, the crude, crudest but you know most effective way is obviously is linking from each content page to your Google Plus profile. Uh, of course, always you have to have that two-way link, so you link back from your contributor to links in your Google Plus profile. But you, there, you link to the domain. You all just you don't have to do a link for every single post. You just link to the domain. But link back from now. The, the slightly easier way, but a little bit more technically involved, is if you have a, uh, a content management system like most modern WordPress templates that allow you to set up author profiles on there, then usually um, as long as there's a clear link from each author's content to his or her profile, then you can just link from that profile to the Google Plus uh, profile and link back. And that will so that will if I add a landing, a landing page. page. Yeah, can you get that just for a second? Okay, so so if I if I add a landing page, say about car accidents, I should have the snippet embedded into the page. And I should strip out the site-wide footer, which I believe Yoast uh, SEO automatically does. I'm pretty sure that if you're like using Yoast and you you enter in your rich snippet data, it automatically makes it a site-wide uh, well, rich snippet. I mean, actually, I'm sure you, Rick knows the answer to that question, but I'm I not know really too. Sure. If, you, if you've updated Yoast, you can't even do that anymore. Yoast, uh, we we helped him to understand this, and he took that out of his plugin. Yeah. Uh, used to be able to do that. Then the first change he made when we noticed this was he made it optional, so you could uncheck it, but and then not have it. But now in the, the latest update uh, to his plugin, you can't do it if you want to. He won't let you. Uh, okay, got that, it. Yeah, you that's how even, important. You can even specify whether you want the authorship to show on a specific page or not. Right. Or in the advanced options. Yes. Yeah, so he he got the you know Yoast really got the message uh, quicker than a lot of other plugin manufacturers, a lot of other CMS manufacturers. Uh, he understood the problem here, and he was you know at the forefront of helping his users to correct it. So it actually helps you to do it the right way now. Well, you guys all heard it right here from Mark Trapping and rip out all that rich snippet data from your footers and your sidebars and just put it on the specific pages, or you're gonna have trouble. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I have another question. I don't know if that falls within your area of expertise. The um, I saw the other day Brafton mentioned something like 36% of search queries are pulled directly from schema-related uh, markup. Mm -hmm. Have you got any thoughts on, on schema and the implementation? Isn't that open to a bit of abuse as well? Yeah, a couple things. That first of all, the, the the broader question that you asked, uh, that was that was some amazing information that came out the other day, and that uh, schema. You know, we've known for some time that schema could be important, but it still seemed like a pretty optional thing you do. And what we're seeing now is that uh, Google, in particular, seems to be more. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say dependent on it, but they will jump on it. You know, they'll make use of it if it's if it's there and it's being implemented properly uh, to a greater extent than we even thought uh, was true right now. It, it's interesting that just today, uh, Matt Cutts of Google posted on Google+. Plus. Uh, he started the post out by saying, like, you know, I, I don't post about SEO often, uh, but when I do, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, he's uh, meaning on Google+. Plus. You know, of course, he talks about SEO all the time, but on Google+, Plus, he usually doesn't, and he gave a direct tip today he linked to um, an article that showed how to easily hook up 
um, schema markup for your logo on your site. And he said, we use this, we being Google, we use that. Uh, it's one of the things that we can use to uh, make sure that we have your logo for the knowledge panel result. When people do a branded search uh, for your brand, uh, many of you have probably seen this, you can potentially show up in a box on the right-hand panel of the search results. It'll have your, your brand name and it will show uh, a logo. And if, you, if it's a Google Plus page, it will show the you know, most latest post, things like that. But uh, he said one of the places that we draw that logo from is that schema. So just again, they're, they're talking a lot about this. Now, the, your second part of your question is, uh, can it be abused? And yes, and, and in fact, Google was cracking down on that. Um, that was, I spoke a moment ago about the authorship, but actually it, because um, authorship is a form of, of schema markup, it's, you know, rel equals author, rel equals publisher. Uh, Matt at PubCon didn't just speak about authorship, he highlighted that, but he also said, we're going to be reducing um, all um, rich snippets in search to improve their quality. And what that means from coming from the chief of spam control at Google is we're going to turn up the, the knobs on eliminating the spammy uses of uh, schema for uh, sort of people like people like putting um, you know star ratings on things that don't really aren't really reviews or don't really have a star that kind of thing so yeah they are cracking that that when I ever I speak about this I, I want to say this I get because I get this all every time if somebody says, yeah, but I know, you know, my competitor, so-and-so, is still doing it, and they're getting, you know, and I, I say, yeah. like, okay, they're getting away with it now. But everything in, everything in Google, when they go after stuff like this, it's done algorithmically, it's done on scale, and they yeah. don't get everything, every pass. But they'll, eventually, they, you know, they, they look at the results. Um, every time they do that, they catch some innocent people, which is always sad. They try to correct that as much as they can, but they also turn up the knobs a little bit, and sooner or later... Uh, if you're doing that kind of stuff, it'll get uh, it'll get hit. Sure, because I know there's a way you can. Um, I mean, you can add schema that it doesn't display on your on your your web page, but it, uh, it it's there. You know, the search engines can read it. It's just yeah. with the uh, no display. Yeah, you know, type of things. You know, I yeah. think it's very much open to abuse, and uh, I just think people need to be aware of the fact that, that you can be you can be nailed with it. Yeah, it's the same, you know, it's really no different fundamentally from the good old days, or uh, maybe the bad old days, of, you know, when you used to be able to put uh, keywords in the footer uh, and things like that, and it would actually, you know, influence the search engines. Uh, you know, it'll work, it'll, yeah, it might work now, it might work for a while, but it's the kind of thing, especially if a lot of people start doing it, it starts generating a, a pattern and, and Google will figure out how to, you know, you know how to go after it. So I, you know, I wouldn't recommend... Uh, messing with that, use it, use it, and learn how to use schema properly. It's it's very powerful. It can mm. uh, give you you know a good competitive edge if you're using it properly, and if you use it right, then you're future proofing. You're not going to worry about it that advantage disappearing suddenly one day. Yeah, I've seen um, I've seen Studio Press has also gone with uh, you know their, their their schema markup of um, I don't know if you know Studio well of course you do because your your site is um, a Genesis Child theme. But they've also, which is, um, you know, another, I'm a great fan of Genesis and, uh, you know, that it's pretty secure and it's, I see they've gone that route with the, with the whole schema layout from your post to your article to your schema date, everything. So it's uh, also marked up properly. It's, it's a very nice feature. It's really made it easy to do because I'm not a, I'm not a code monkey. You know, I don't like digging in and messing yeah. around at that level, but I like, I know about these things. I know the value of them. So... Yeah, I agree with you, and that that's made it you know much easier for a guy like me to make use of it. Um, and you know, I would encourage people to learn, you know, study and learn more about uh, those features. And if you use something like Genesis, then you don't have to be, um, you know, you don't have to be a code monkey to be able to take advantage of them. You can uh, the the interface is right there to yeah. to do it. Yeah, no, because I know I mean schema for the average user. You know, you send them off to to. Um, Schema.org. It's I quite I look at it and my eye, I just go squint immediately yeah. because you know <laughs> after you press three links you on some art literature page maybe you know type of thing so it can get very uh, very confusing and overwhelming to say the to say the least. 
Yeah, you know, it's 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 sad because uh, well, this is the Google way, right? They they implement things and they say, you know, they cheerfully smilingly say like, you know, you should you should use this. It's it's great and it will help you. And the you know ninety percent of the people out there are more go look at it and say like you know this makes my head hurt. I don't know you know I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to how to implement it. It's so hard and technical. So yeah. we can always be grateful when third parties take that burden and make it a little easier for us. Well, we do, we did that with um, for the circle of legal trust guys. We actually um, I got a guy to to code some uh, some schema creator. Templates for local business, for a person, and for a video. Nice. So I think it's uh, you know time to start expanding that out to like you say the logo image because that'll be very good for the branding and um, you know all of those things just to make it a bit easier for the for the layperson because it is a pretty difficult yeah area. And another thing that you know that you can get good plugins for now that I'll that I'll plug because I'm talking about plugins uh, that people should be doing for on the social side. Is uh, implementing uh, the Open Graph protocol, uh, optimizing your social shares. Uh, we we've seen tremendous results from doing this, uh, especially now that uh, more and more social platforms and even Twitter are becoming more visual, uh, giving more options uh, to do things. So you can actually, you know, using Open Graph, you can actually format how you want your social shares to look. Uh, I still see every day things like you know I go I, I click the click the share button on somebody's site, and the way it comes up is is horrible. Today you know somebody I wanted to uh, share somebody's blog post, and I, they had a Twitter button on the thing. I hit the twi Twitter but Twitter button, and what came up in the tweet was the name of their site. Uh, you know, how useful is that? Uh, you know if I tweeted that out, that means nothing to anybody. That's not going to get any responses. Yeah. Uh, so with with Open Graph, you can you can format you know what you want the headline to look like. Uh, if you're sharing it as something like Facebook or Google Plus or LinkedIn, you know what what the description text will look like. What image you want to show up. You know now like Google Plus and Facebook now, uh, if you have the right size images and you tag them correctly, um, they'll show up as big images in the post, which get a lot more engagement. So again, there's plugins that can help you automate that, so you don't have to code it yourself. And I use them every day. Okay. Then just related to that, sorry, Mark, I'm taking all the questions here. Sorry, Michael. Um, the also relate, sort of related to the open graph, although not entirely, is uh, your, your, your Dublin Core. What is your view on using Dublin Core metadata for your site to help the search engines understand things better and, and that sort of thing? Uh, what was that term again? Dublin Core. DC, not not familiar. Uh, I will I will plead ignorance before the court. Um, yeah, you've reached you've reached the limits of my. Now it's something I'll need to look into, but um, I, I don't know anything. It's, about. it's in line with your open graph, and, and you know it almost looks okay. exactly the same as, as your as your open graph. I put it in the sidebar there, the Dublin Core Meta Metadata Basics. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I had an argument with somebody. Probably about three years ago, with regards to this Dublin Core, because I said it's, you know, it's just an added to something extra, like your open graph and your metadata and that sort of thing. And um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were, would be. You know, it's, I think it's all in line with the trying to standardize everything and 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 create this whole semantic web. You know, it's all in line with the David Emmerland and yourself and the things that you talk about. So. Um, you know, you'll you'll often see also if you do anything in Photoshop that it that it gives you the the, the option of if, of adding Dublin Core metadata to images, that sort of thing. So, you know, without overcomplicating it, my question is is um, should we start getting used to these sort of things to make it as easy as possible for the search engines to classify and categorize us correctly? Yes, we're we're in that uh, we're in this transition period now, and this is what you know. You mentioned David Amel and his book on Google Semantic Search. Uh, what a what a lot of people didn't understand about that book, and and maybe David could have been more clear about it uh, in his introduction, but uh, whatever it is uh, that he, he in that book he's talking about that which is and that which will be, um, and there's a lot of intermix in there, and and partly that's because he wasn't fully 
aware of you know what how how much some things are being implemented now, how much of it may be in the future. But all that to say, we're we're in the um, the paradigm shift. We're in the transition days into the semantic web. The dream is the day when uh, search engines like Google will have developed uh, artificial intelligence to the point where they can, you know, the, the machine can go in and just look at your site and understand what things are the way that we as humans do. You know, if I'm, if I'm looking at your site, you don't have to tell me as a human, oh, that, that's an address, and that's a review, you know, and that's a name, uh, you know, and that's, that's this and that's that. Um, the dream is, and the, the goal is, that someday uh, the, the search engine bots will be able to do that. But they're not quite there yet. But what is there, or is more there, is the structure within the Google algorithm to make use of that information. And what structured data does is it's the crutch, if you will, for now. It's okay. saying, like, you know, here's, you know, this is Google. This is an address. That's a name. That's, that's, a, that's an image. And that's, this is what that image means. Mm -hmm. uh, that you're helping them along so that they can make those connections more quickly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, may, it makes perfect sense, and it, it uh, just speaks exactly into what you, we were talking about with regards to the schema. So the more that we can, I, I, I mean, I think when you initially came onto the circle of legal trust, we, we had a similar conversation where we spoke about the use of schema and, you know, how much is it is it worth it to follow, and it just seems to be coming more and more worth it to follow. Yeah. Um, you know, things like the Dublin Core Initiative, I'm sort of sitting on the fence because I'm, you know, I, I see schema. We saw micro formats. We saw uh, micro data. You know, there's so many different things, and they, we need to sort of get to a, a standard that we can say, okay, let's let's sort of work according to one. Now I'm seeing a lot of a lot of sites are coded with Dublin Core when I do it like a page source analysis, um, as well as schema. So you know, it's. I, the schema makes sense. I've sort of got my head around schema, and every now and then I, I remember Dublin course. So I try and do that as well. So it's just uh, I wish they would standardize it if I could put it that way. Yeah, it's hard. I, you know, schema is easy because we know that they've standardized. All the major search engines, you know, yes. bought into that. So that's one we know. But uh, yeah, some other things like what you're bringing up are interesting. It's just hard to know how much are they using it, or you know, is one using it, not are they not using it. Um, yeah, it'd be wonderful if we had more more standardization on that. Um, right now, it's still a little bit of the wild west on on some of it. Um, but I, it's something. Yeah, thank you for the link. I uh, opened it, and I will definitely look more into that. I need to learn hey, about Mark, it. Mark, mm -hmm. can I ask a question real quick? Back in back in the day, uh, what are your inside sources telling you about the blogger blogs? Because that's kind of where I started. Uh, with blogger blogs, mm -hmm. and they still show up in search very nicely, uh, but unfortunately, I just don't really know how to make them look so, so pretty as these WordPress blogs, and I know Google has added a lot to it. I never hear anybody talk about blogger blogs anymore. <laughs> but I show up good in search with them, locally anyway. Yeah, it, there, Mark. it's yeah. The, the, you know, blogger is a tough subject because it, it's it. There's so many. You're weighing so many trade-offs. Uh, yeah, I think you know the, the the biggest distinctive is that it's Google, obviously. Uh, now, you know, Google insists that they don't give any favorites, any favorites, any preference to to blogger. Um, and I, you know, I believe them at a fundamental level. However, it's you know, it's tied into their system. It's on their servers. So I think there's an advantage of that, you know, whatever happens there, they can see very easily. Um, and it's probably constructed just by design in some ways that uh, it makes it easier for them to crawl, easier for them to do. So there's that side of it. Um, and, you know, some of the some of the integrations with Google Plus and uh, things like that have been interesting on there. What you give up, with either something like Blogger or with you know uh, WordPress.com kind of blog, is you give up a lot of features and control uh, that you don't have. You, know, you you have the feature set that they give you, and that's all you have. With an independent uh, WordPress installation, 
something like that, you know, the sky's the limit almost on what you can do with it as far as customization. Uh, so, you know, at a, at a very simple level, that's the that's the trade-offs. Uh, and I think there's a I don't know if it's really warranted or not. You know, you say like you don't hear much about uh, the blogger blog. I think there's a kind of almost a prejudice uh, against it in, in the, uh, the cognoscenti of uh, online uh, content and marketing and things like that, uh, simply because it seems like training wheels. You know, you're on you're on somebody else's platform. Uh, you lose that. You also give up just that you know establishment of your own domain, uh, which is hard work to do. We all know that, but there's there's real advantages in getting uh, getting your own domain established, building up a history that over time a domain that's got your name, your branding connected with it. Uh, yeah, you're getting the bump of being on on Google.com, but uh, that's you know at the end of the day that's that's Google's advantage, not yours. So that, that may have been oversimplistic, but I don't know if I covered what you. I'm not, I'm not hearing anything at the moment. I muted it, so it wouldn't create a problem. Uh, okay. The other question I had is, uh, I was just wondering about publisher because that connects right to your Google uh, Places page, and we see that in, in local search so much. Uh, my question is, is publisher just meant for uh, one publisher for one website, or if I have several websites, is it okay to make them link to the, to the same publisher? If, if you get what I'm trying to say, I'm not I do, sure. I do, get, I do get what you're trying to say. Um, yeah, fundamentally, yes, it's meant for one, you know, a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, as far as as far as sites, however, here's a here's a little-known secret: within a domain, you can have any number of separate publisher links to that. You know, how do we know that? Because Google does it itself. Um, Google has uh, uh, multiple pages. Uh, Google Plus brand pages that are linked to parts of Google.com. So you could, for example, if you have uh, different subdomains within your within your site, each of those sites could have a page, uh, and and you could link, or do a, a publisher link, verify publisher link to that uh, for that site and that page. But you can't get a verified link from multiple sites to one page. Now within the local and, and I'm you know and again I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest here about certain my fingers because we don't work much with at, in Stone Temple we don't work much with local um, and so I don't know I know I or I think there are ways to connect multiple local instances up with a single page uh, it's still a bit of a mess from my understanding and hard to do but I think that can be done. Uh, but I'll be honest there, I'm, I, you know, I'm not an expert on that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Does anybody else have any more questions for Mark? Because we have another speaker up. Anybody else? Um, can you just kind of let know we got another speaker coming on? Or we'll okay, so Mark, it sounds like we got another speaker about to start. So. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you, thank you very much. This was this was fun. I hope this was useful. Uh, you guys always enjoyed talking with you, and I'm glad we were able to put it together. Uh, enjoy the rest of your time, and um, and look forward to the next time we get to talk. Thank you, guys. Go do great work. We'll talk to you next time. Yeah, you can ask questions. Are we on? We should be on. Okay. Uh, well, I'll know the live chat.
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Where's the the audio mic pick up here? I have no idea. Okay. But you should be able to pick which one. Hello. Hello. I looks like we're muted. I am muted. You did? Yeah. All right. Are we on? Can everyone hear this? You have the risk of saying the most awful thing people have to say throughout in presentations. So uh, very quickly, my name is Conrad Salm. Um, I ran. It does not look like we're running audio. Audrey, can you hear? Uh, I can hear you. Yes. Awesome. Can't, can't see you. That's probably better. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so uh, my name is Conrad Salm. I got into legal about uh, in 2006 when Avo was a idea of. It was me and eight developers, and we were trying to figure out what we could do to change the way consumers interacted with the legal profession. Um, we had a very small amount of money in the bank, and we wanted to essentially take down players like FineLawLawyers.com, and we, we, we came across SEO as being the only way to do that. So I spent the first probably three years at Ava working up SEO, and then we built out a team, and we had social media people, and we had email people and stuff like that. But I split off from Ava because what I really like doing is working directly with attorneys and dealing with their overall marketing strategy with a heavy focus on um, online. So I'm familiar with a lot of the people in this group because I've probably <laughs> researched your own websites many times. Um, I've crawled a bunch of, I know I'm looking at this room, I've been at, at least three of you. Uh, I've, I've been all over your website looking at how you guys are doing things. Um, my perspective on this is that this is a much more intermediate to advanced group than most of the groups that I speak with. So in terms of coming up with what should we talk about, I thought what I'd do is, is review, when, when we bring on a client, invariably we come up with things that are so mind-numbingly obvious that need to be changed. But as a group, as the legal industry tends to be sheep and you tend to follow what other people are doing. So what I'm going to identify are 10 things that may apply to you, they may not apply to you, um, but that I feel like are being done incorrectly. And it's low-hanging fruit. When we engage with a client initially, my job is to spend your money as wisely as possible. So frankly, I look for the easiest thing that I can do to generate results. And so in no particular order, I'm going to go through 10 things, and I'm happy to kind of dive deep into some of these if, if there are any questions. Um, and this really is in no particular order, but I'm going to start with multi-language. Uh, a lot of you guys have an awesome page that says Hablo Español, right, which is the extent of my uh, understanding of the Spanish language, which means you speak Spanish. Great. Um, there are lots of web pages out there that say that they speak Spanish. What's missing is a good Spanish translation of your money pages. Why don't you have practice area pages that are actually translated correctly in Spanish and English, and whatever the other, other languages that you have available um, to you. When we have implemented correctly, and there's, there's ways to do this correctly, and there's ways to do this incorrectly. When we have implemented multilingual sites correctly, depending on the geography, we see a five to, sometimes we saw one site that went up 40%. And you are capturing traffic that is, look, it, this is the hardest thing. I want to get people to my practice area pages, because those are the high converting pages. Put up a multi-language site. Do it correctly. In WordPress, there's there's three major plugins that will do the. Well, let me let me step back. The way well, I keep saying do it correctly. That you need to tell the search engines that this page over here and this page over here are the same exact page. They're just translated. So I believe it's called the canonical language tag. I could be wrong uh, about that, but that's one of the things that um, you need in order to do it correctly. You need to make sure that that happens. There's a bunch of WordPress plugins that do that well, and um, they're, they're not that expensive, and they're totally worth it. So when we've done these things, we've seen, you know, depending on where you are, a 5 to 40% increase in traffic, and it happens pretty quickly. Uh, so that is, is I, I so frequently see next to the phone number, we speak Spanish, and it may link to a page that say we speak Spanish, but um, I want the practice areas in Spanish. And, and, and the translation needs to be done by someone who speaks Spanish. Do not automate the translation. It doesn't work. Um, it's more expensive, but make the investment. Um, running this through something that's just going to translate, it, it always reads ridiculous. Um, next one. And, and, and if anyone, I'm not sure on the format here, but if, if someone wants to interrupt and ask questions, I'm happy to uh, do that. The next one is, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah. Yeah. You're saying that's not effective. I, I wouldn't bother with it. Um, uh, can you just repeat the question because we can't hear it? So repeat the question and then answer. Sorry. The, the question was: Is Google Translator? Why not? Why not just use that? It, in my opinion, and from our experience, it's not adequate, and it doesn't read very well. Um, so we we always outsource specifically Spanish to. Uh, someone with a uh, a native Spanish speaker who has a criminal justice degree because I, you just can't automate these translations. They always end up sounding ridiculous, which is even worse, right? Because you finally get someone to your page, maybe, and then they're like, oh, they don't really speak Spanish. They just ran this or something. And um, there's innumerable examples of awful translations that have been out there. Um, so my next point is um, pay-per-click advertising. And a lot of times I will talk to attorneys and, and they, they often view PPC as binary. AdWords worked, it doesn't work, and you either turn it on or off. The beauty of pay-per-click, and this is a tool that everyone has at their disposal, is that you can choose how much to spend, right? That's the whole bidding system. And because you can choose how much to spend, you can actually define your return on investment for pay-per-click. You can turn it up and your paper and your invest. And so the other thing is. The economics of pay-per-click are backwards. For everything else that you do, everything else that we know when we buy things, the more volume you buy, the less it costs per unit. Sugar, guns, butter, Yankees tickets, whatever it may be, the more you buy, the less it costs per unit. Pay-per-click is, is one of the very few things where that is backwards, where the more you buy, the more you actually spend per unit. And so that means that Every single lawyer has a positive return on investment in pay-per-click somewhere at a very low spend. And what we do, and this is very simple, we run all of our clients' overall budget, 10% at a minimum goes towards pay-per-click. Because I know at a very low spend that your positive, your, your ROI is extremely positive. And so that, that's, that's the next thing that I think about with pay-per-click is there's no reason not to be running pay-per-click but you need to think about the return on investment. And, and you don't want to win. You guys are all so type A and you all want to win and you've been trained in law school to win and you go to cases to win. You do not want to win in pay-per-click because you will lose on your return on investment. You are number one in pay-per-click. You are blowing money down the toilet. I'm absolutely certain of that because there are a lot of people in this industry who are not bidding rationally. They're bidding to win. And when you bid to win, you end up losing money. <clears throat> Which brings me to uh, number three. This is my, my, my biggest pay-per-click recommendation, and it's the easiest thing to do, and nobody's doing it. You guys are all running AdWords because that's where everyone is. Great. Because of this, this economies of scale, where the more people that are in the market, the more it costs per unit, you guys are all fishing in a pond that everyone else is fishing in. None of you guys are on Bing. It's ridiculous. So what you need to do, and Bing's made this like mind-numbingly easy, to take your AdWords campaign and push it into Bing. What we have found, and the volume's not there, but the ROI is much greater. So what we have found is when we move an AdWords campaign without doing anything else to it, you just take an AdWords campaign, move it over into Bing, um, your cost per clicks are going to drop. And they drop by 300 to 500%, which means your ROI is three to five times more effective. And even better, if you are in a very, very, so we've seen this once, granted, we've only seen it once, but if you're in a very, very specialized area, there's nobody in Bing. There's nobody advertising in Bing. That means your volume can actually go up. So we had a very, very specialized client. We moved them out of AdWords. There was you know, five or six competitors playing in AdWords. We moved them to Bing, and they were the only player there. They were able to buy into the top spot in advertising at pennies. Beautiful return on investment. So that's that's my thing. You know, I live in Seattle. Microsoft's in Seattle. This this little pitch helped my housing prices. But advertise on Bing because you're wasting you're wasting money if you don't. Yahoo. Well, so Bing the, the Bing ads drive Yahoo. So you'll you'll get into Yahoo. Although Yahoo is circling the drain, um, but you will get into Yahoo. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I mean, it is the exact. Same. Don't even don't even think about Yahoo. I hate to say that, but like, just think about being in your in your hand. 
The next tip is over time, what you really want to do, if you're running both of them, you want to see your cost per clicks actually at the same level. So at the end of every month or at the end of every quarter, go run your CPCs across those different campaigns, and that's where you start to adjust. Because buying traffic at $4 on AdWords and $1 on Bing, let's buy more traffic on Bing. So ultimately, you can maximize your spend or, or, or maximize the traffic that you buy within a given spend by matching the CPCs across those uh, across those two different platforms, and it's it, no, but so then then just pour, then then you're willing to spend more money there, right? If if you max out their inventory, like great, so so now you're winning, right? But you're yeah yeah. Um, generally, over time, what we see is, and this is across all marketing channels, when, when we look at the cost per client across marketing channels, when we start out, we generally see really, really variable rates. Clients from Avo are costing you $300. Clients from AdWords are costing you $1,200. Ultimately, you can most effectively spend your marketing mix by having those cost per clients be the same and pouring that money into those things that are less effective to those that are more cost effective. Okay, um, the next one is a lie that we, the SEO industry, has been telling you guys, and that is that it's all about content. Um, there is a lot of garbage content out there, and the garbage content is a waste of time. It's a complete waste of time. So when I talk about content, and we, frankly, we spend a lot of money on content, but we do really good content. So there are two pieces of content that I would really think about um, aggressively. One is what we call faceted practice areas. And that means it's not divorce. It is men's divorce, or it is child's custody and divorce, or it's out of state divorce, or it's military divorce. There are numerous facets of what that content looks like. And almost always, when you think through the different ways that you can cut up the practice area that you're working on, you can almost always slice that in a more finite fashion. And that almost always helps. Um, so I would very much look at your, your practice area map and think about how can we break these things out into more facets of what we're doing. No, no, absolutely not. So, so I really want to have a a page about. Um, I'm taking this to an extreme, but overseas military divorces, right? How do I deal with that? Um, and every single page. And this, the one thing that this assumes is that the, you have the authority to get these pages in the deck, right? If you don't have enough authority to your site and you have 1,000, so I'll use Avo as an example. When we started, we launched with, I want to say, something like 1.1 million pages. And because we had just started, we didn't have much authority, although the lawsuit helped with that. Um, the, we only had you know, 80,000 pages that were indexed. So we had all this content that actually wasn't indexed. So you want to make sure that you have the authority to support um, the pages. Yes, sir. I'll give an example. Yeah, go ahead. I'll give an example. But he's absolutely right. Most content. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Us, we can't hear the questions or the yeah. discussion. So, so let, let me just let me just interject. The, the question was, can you give some examples of great content within PI that would be a uh, low-hanging fruit? Okay. Very specific to what somebody wants. We just did, I just did something this week. And it was I just did something this week, and it's essentially a bug. We're, we're very big in bicycle work in California. We just did something. I don't even know if it's put up yet. But uh, how we succeed, how we can succeed, and how we do it, on how we can still succeed when a bicyclist rides across a crosswalk, and how. Now that is something that is so specific that uh, that someone is going to want to know that it's very specific. This stuff gets searched, and the long—I mean, I don't need to talk too much about the long tail getting bigger and more important. But being able to capture this very specific information is frankly pretty easy because most of your competitors aren't taking the time to write really good practice area-based content. Um, so the the other thing that I would caution against is doing the news rewrite approach. The news rewrites for content, you may do a really good job at grabbing a bunch of traffic, and your, your SEO numbers, your natural search graph, might look great because you're doing a bunch of news rewrites. But no one's picking up the phone to call you 
because they're looking for information about a news story. And so one of the things that I recommend and one of the things that we do with our clients is to say, okay, and a news rewrite, frankly, it's not, it's not going to drive those phone calls. One of the things you can do is uh, filter by natural search in Google Analytics, look at your landing pages on the behavior tab, and look at those pages that are driving the most volume to your site, and then ask whether or not those people who are coming to those pages through a natural search query are actually going to pick up the phone and call you. And the answer is they're not. Very rarely do I see the high converting pages at the top of that list. They're generally very further down. Okay. Um, another thing that we lie about frequently when we talk so, to lawyers. Yes. Yeah. So, quick question. So you, should you ever do a news re regurgitation, recap, whatever? I mean, what's the purpose of that? <laughs> Let me repeat the question so I have time to think of a really good answer. The question was, should you ever do a news rewrite? And, and I'll give you... <laughs> That's where it's going. So, so the answer here is, if you can... Doing a news rewrite is a waste of time. Rewriting the news is a waste of time. Hiring someone to rewrite it for, for $8 a post or spinning, whatever, whatever it is, that is a waste of time. To the extent that you can put your own perspective, to the extent that it is relevant to, I mean, this is a great example. Look at CNN. A third of the things on CNN.com you can comment on, right? And you can have an insight. There's someone's getting a divorce. Someone just, uh, the, 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 the ship in South Korea. Like, you can comment on this, and you can have a really, really good, insightful piece of commentary about the news. That's really helpful, but it's not an $8 a page. Um, so that's the way I look at, at, at what's going on in the news. Um, and it, it can be great link bait. Next step. Um, one of the things that I talk to lawyers about frequently is, and I got asked this at the Lawyeronomics conference uh, two days ago, is what is an appropriate bounce rate? How, how high is a bounce rate that I should be concerned about? And the answer is, 100% bounce rate, if the first thing that everyone does uh, after they enter your, your website is to call your phone, is a great bounce rate. So don't look at things like bounce rate and time on site to determine the quality of your traffic. The quality of the traffic, there's only one thing that, that means it's important about the quality of your traffic. Did they pick up the phone? Um, and so bounce rates and time on site, these are really great metrics if you are selling ads if you're Avvo, for example, right, because they want to have lots of page terms and they want to have a lot of time on site, that is an ad-supported model. You guys are a phone call-supported model. So think about the phone calls and not things like bounce rates and time on site. Okay, the next one is something that I've written about fairly regularly, and this drives me crazy. And I'm probably going to overstate this, but I will. Social media is a complete distraction to what most of you guys are doing. Um, social media is a very good networking tool, but social media marketing with the notion that I can find people who just got a speeding ticket through Twitter is very, very difficult. It, and, and, and I would say it is, we, we tend to have the tail wagging the dog here. A lot of the time you're wasting your money on social media marketing. Um, the social media marketing consultants disagree with me fairly vehemently, um, but uh, think through that. The other thing is, social media does not impact SEO, right? Now, there's a, there's a corollary to that. If I have a great social profile, and, and I'm a great example of this. I use my social profile to push out really good pieces of content that I write that gets shared, that gets linked to, that gets tweeted, and, and it brings me traffic. That's good social media marketing. But the ability for a slip and fall lawyer to develop a, a community of people who frequently slip and fall and find the thought leaders of people who are clumsy and slip and fall all the time doesn't exist. So um, use social media judiciously. The other thing is all of the important things that you need to do with social media are automated with tools, right? And so paying a social media consultant, I talked to an attorney who, I'm paying someone to post my, my blog posts on Facebook. Really? Like, these are plugins. This should all be automated. So I, I strongly believe that social media is oversold to this industry. Um, here's another one. This is something that a lot of people don't think about, but it is very critical. If you're running WordPress, it needs to be on a managed WordPress host. Um, that is 
absolutely critical. You will move your uh, hosting budget from $9 a month or $6 a month up to about $30 a month. WordPress is unbelievably vulnerable to hacks, and it is taking undoing this is a pain in the neck. Uh, and the biggest problem that you'll find is that you'll you'll, you'll do a search for your site and you'll get a little warning that says this site uh, may contain malicious software or something to that effect. And that'll that'll be there for about two weeks and then your site won't show up. You will disappear. Undoing Called Zippy Kids, which is a horrible name. They've now changed it to something that's um, slash WordPress. So it's 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 a, a very good investment of twenty dollars a month. Um, we're talking a little bit about link building. One of the things there's a huge gap in the marketing world from the SEO geeks to the kind of more traditional marketing world. Your biggest link building allies at, at all stays true with my clients today. We have a PR agency on retainer. Your opportunity will come through PR. And, and, and thinking about having a PR agency on retainer when you have the right story and the right opportunity as the agency who stands in the building you as we would call PR is, can be amazingly effective. Now this doesn't work for everyone. You don't always have things that you can talk about, but if you have an opportunity to get in the news, if you have the opportunity to get cited by this, be amazingly effective at getting the impossible to get links. And I just throw something in. Every member of the circle we will trust has to be the PR about is. I, so I have all. Uh, Mike, if you can hear me, uh, Dan's computer's gone off. I think unmute yourself, Mike, and give the your computer over. <laughs> did you did you lose the audio on her? Yeah, we actually lost it quite a bit. If you can go back, even back to WordPress hosting, um, it was breaking up, breaking up quite a lot. It's frozen again. We can't uh, can't hear anything. Can you want to just use the computer then? Sure, I can move over. At least it's not a technology discussion that we're having here. <laughs> that's, that's horrible when that happens. Um, so really quickly, and I don't want to interject too much, but the... the Excellent. So PR agencies can be your best link building friend, and, and you have to do it right. There has to be a story. You have to have an agency that understands that 80% of their job is not to get you mentioned somewhere. It's to get the link. Um, but there are agencies who are starting to figure out what this looks like. The ugly side, and this, this is something that just bothers me a lot, is Black Hat works. It's still working. And there are a small group that have talked about this ad nauseum. We, there, there's three of us, frankly, and we talk about the problems with Black Hat and legal. As a group, we believe that for whatever reason, the legal industry has got a bit of a pass. There's stuff that goes on in legal that just cannot exist anywhere else. And I don't understand it. I don't like it. Um, I whine about it. Uh, but Black Hat still works. I'm not recommending you do it. I won't do it for you if you ever call me. Um, 
But the reality is we're dealing in a situation where this stuff still works. And I'll give you an example. And you guys, many of you are guilty of this. The best practice is to have one website for a company, right? And most of you have multiple websites. That at some point, and I'm not suggesting you go off and consolidate everything. I'm just suggesting that we have, as an industry, it seems to me that we have a bit of a pass um, in terms of what is is let through and what's not let through. Now, all of you have gotten smacked by Penguin and are like, yeah, really, Conrad? Um, but the, the legal industry, especially some of the big box players, seem to have a, a pass on some of the black hat stuff. So it's highly possible that that is going to change over time. Um, and, and, and I worry about a huge shuffle in what happens in legal down the road. Um, the last one, and then I'll, I'll give away kind of what I, I view as the future of, of, of SEO. There, there's, so a long time ago they took a, they gave you not provided, right? So in Google Analytics you, you lost a lot of the keywords, and now it's something like 85% of keywords are gone. So a lot of, a lot of the not provided has, has taken away the keyword data. And we just learned recently that they're taking that data out of your PPC campaigns. So we're going to, right, yeah. We're going to be flying fairly blind here. Um, that data still exists, and you all have access to it, and it's in Google Webmaster Tools, okay? So all of your data about keyword information still exists in Google Webmaster Tools. Now, it's not structured. It's not easy to get to. Um, those of you who are familiar with Vanessa, Vanessa Fox, uh, she actually started Google Webmaster Tools at Google uh, probably a decade ago now. But uh, we've, we've got a tool that's coming out that will show you your keyword information as well as estimates of if we do make some improvements here, this is what it'll mean like for traffic. And so if any of you guys, I don't want to make this sound like a sales pitch, but there is a tool coming out that will help show your keyword data um, in a much better light than you. We've been able, been able to see for about 18 months now. So the keyword data is still there. You just need to know where to find it and how to get to it. Um, and I'll leave with one thought. Uh, I'm often asked, like, what do you see as the future? Where should we go if we're trying to look forward? What does this look like in 12 months? In fact, the last speaker spoke about this. Um, and we ended on this. I believe, and this is my perspective, this is based on, actually this is based on what Matt Cutts has not said. Um, I think there is going to be a huge push towards authorship because authorship solves a lot of problems for the search engine. So authorship was really big. Everyone got very excited about it. And there have only been two things that have come out of Google since then. And, and we covered both of them in the last speaker. One was the reduction of about 10% of search results, including authorship. So they were cutting off the bottom of the barrel. Um, and if you got hit, like, I'm sorry, but uh, they, were, they were really saying, we're going to give authorship a quality component, which didn't exist before. And the other happened about 10 days ago. There was a, a conversation about the difference between reputation, uh, sorry, popularity and authority. And the fact that they're talking about the difference between popularity and authority, this tells me that the search engines are taking extremely seriously the notion that they can identify individuals who are very smart about a given situation as opposed to just really popular. But they're not talking about this a lot. My personal take is the reason they're not talking about this a lot is because they, it's really, really helpful. And one of the things that I, I love hearing Matt say is, um, Every time we come up with something really good, you guys go and ruin it. We have to get rid of it. So I think, this is the Conrad opinion, that we're not hearing about authorship because it is so valuable and we don't want, and, it's, and in Google specifically, doesn't want people going out trying to figure out how to, how to spam and scam authorship. Um, so if I were investing in what I think the future looks like, it would, it would involve creating yourselves not as, not as being popular, but being, what does it take to, to define yourself as an authority on a specific topic? What does that look like? Trying to solve that riddle, I think, will pay dividends in the long run. Follow up question. Yes. How, what, what are the three things you do to push authorship? Um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of, so the question from Seth was, what are the three things you would do to push authorship? And I think what you need to think about, and there was a great example, being cited by the highly authoritative, authoritative, relevant sources, and I mean cited like as in citations. Um, 
I think is going to become increasingly important. What do you mean? I'll give you an example. Um, and this is a self-serving example. I don't know this, but one of the things that the AVO algorithm tried to do was provide a resume score. It's simply a resume score. That, that looks like highly authoritative to me. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that this is actually happening, but I'm, I'm giving an example of the way I would be thinking about this. A resume score on your background um, as an attorney becomes really important in terms of are you popular or are you an authority? And what goes into that, how I'll go build that, like it's a whole different, different conversation. But what do I have to do in order to um, look like that authority? Does that make sense? Well, Ironically, with Avo, I think it's the opposite because they made it a popularity contest. Well, that's a whole but, different but, 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 but going back to no, off yeah. for real. Look, it, goes, it feels like we're back to like you know 2009, where like oh, the answer is just get get yourself away from CNN. You know what? What can we be doing fundamental to the average attorney out there? Like, you know, is it publishing and making sure that every place that you publish something, you're you're getting your rally goes author. This is my guess, and I don't know that I'm right about this, but I'm trying to give you a guess. My guess is doing things like being published in a law journal is going to be really important. So you're not suggesting the old styles of writing an ebook on every case type, like I, sending that out and having it on Amazon. Yeah. I, I really, so that's a great example of popularity. So I'm going to write an ebook, and we're going to push it out on Amazon. It's going to be all over the place. Anyone can write an ebook, and there are certainly people who will write an ebook for you in an hour, right? Um, but it is on Amazon. It has a skew. It has all those things that are some different. So, so, so the next thing. So, I mean, like, I am guessing here. I am, I am really guessing here. The next thing you might say is, um, is, is writing an ebook more authoritative than being published in? Uh, let's let's move out of lawyers because it's easier to talk about. Um, let's say let's look, let's use doctors, right? Is is writing an ebook about treating your plantar fasciitis? More relevant from a from a authority perspective than having published something in the New York New England Journal of Medicine about plantar fasciitis, um, and I think that's the, the and I'm guessing here, but I think that's where we're going. But as grassroots people, we're more in control of the ability to write an ebook rather than to get an article. And then, so look, let's take a of Georgetown Law Review. Correct. Let's, kind of, let's, let's split the difference of what you guys are talking about. If ebook is is at one end, which is completely manufactured, do it up. And in the New England Journal of Medicine, the most lawyers are the equivalent of the American law, the, the top one, would be very, very hard to get. Yeah. What are the other basic fundamentals that wouldn't be self-generated ebook, but aren't, you know, as protected as the top 1% of authority sources? Well, I'll tell you what's worked for me is, is the Oregon State Bar Journal. You know, that, that's more accessible than, you know, the ABA Journal. You can find it in that, the, the two practice areas that I, that I published in the Oregon State Bar Journal, I'm, I'm at the top of Google uh, in those practice area searches. And that's just my experience. But, and that is not so hard to get in a state publication like that. Is that a letter to the editor, a comment, or an article? It's an article. Okay. Sure. And, and we'll see where this goes. Like, yeah. I'm kind of sidestepping your question, Seth, because I don't actually know the answer. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have really good examples of what, I mean, this is actually a great example. I'm just trying to like read the tea leaves, and based on what they're not saying, and, and the other thing with authorship is it, it's a really good anti-spam tool, right? If I can identify and use authorship as a um, primary ranking factor, I can also make sure that the links written by someone who's an authority on something are actually genuine. So I see these two things overlapping. I guess I'm always looking, knowing that there's not enough data points with just the highest level of these top, top journals, although you make this a great point, is the idea that the websites that you are authoring, making sure that you look at those, and those sites have the Google data points of lower balance rate, even though we understand those, you know, um, time on site, other things that might show that people care about what you're doing. Social media is not, you know, that's yeah. one of the other areas where you can type authorship. Any of these, like, we have to revisit? Um, I don't think I don't think your standard quality metrics are uh, fall into this. Like, do we have good content? Like, I can I can look at pictures of girls in bikinis all day long, right? I may have a long time on site, but is that really good content? I don't know. Um, Obviously, if you look at it for a long time, 
Well, <laughs> I'm not sure why that example came to life, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, but you brought up something interesting. Is, is this is how social media starts to impact things, right? Do, do we start to develop a profile of, hey, you know what, the, I'm pulling this out of the air, but the, the Washington State Attorney General follows this stuff, and therefore it's, it's high, more authoritative and not necessarily just popular. Maybe. I don't know. But a lot of people in this room kind of disproportionate amount of time on Google Plus. If you were the, if you were guessing, is that their hope that it would become a Twitter where they could actually tell authority through it? Uh, well that's already happening, right? Um, and that that's that that ship to some extent has sailed. And <laughs> and I would I would say that that's very much the case. I mean un unfortunately Plus is full of uh, SEO geeks and real estate agents and plumbers. And lawyers, and that's it. Um, I think it comes down to you need other people in your field talking about you, just like this gentleman that raised the part about the Oregon Bar Association. You know, if Chef Denny's talking about me on Google Plus, well, that's nice, but I don't really think that's you know it, that that's just a little bit of banner fodder, nice. And, and if you're on Chef Denny talking, Conrad, that's nice too. Right. You got, but if you're at the Circle of Legal Trust talking about marketing, and we got a really nice website up, and we've got guys like Dan Goldstein, Eric Enga, Mark Traphagen coming around, I think you're going to get some authority. I mean, I go, I go like this. Leonardo da Vinci didn't put one damn article on the, on the Internet. But if I want to know about Leonardo da Vinci, I sure can find it pretty damn easy. And it's because so many people have written about him. Right. But my mentor, who taught me how to practice law and be a, a really good lawyer because he trained me, he was pre-internet. There's only one article about him on there, and it's right. the one I wrote. You could never find him. You right. never know he existed on our internet anymore. It's, it's just, I think, that's just my little training wheel thought. It's, uh... It, it, it will. So my guess is things are going to continue to change, and we'll see continue to see more volatility um, as the spam gets cracked down on, and as they try and figure out what to replace that with. What what are we replacing links with, right? Because the links are the big thing. That's what made them different. How are they replacing the concept of links, and 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 what do we have to do to be ahead of the curve in thinking about? So, Conrad, you said something that kind of struck me. Um, you mentioned that uh, attorneys with multiple websites might be considered black box. I mean, black. Um, yeah. Uh, black, black hat. Yeah. Um, and so, if you have a a, a a website for a certain practice area. Yeah. For example, I just did on trucking. That is that is that black hat. Well, um, the, I mean, your so, definition so of black hat. I'll I'll give you the so I'll give you the Miley Oye answer to that. And Miley's, Miley is at Google. She's been there forever. Um, and, and I've had this conversation. Because the, the legal, you guys went bananas about buying domains. Like when Exact Match Domain came out, like you guys just went absolutely crazy. And then some of you put sites on like 10% of the domains that you bought, right? So the volume of sites is bizarre. All right, maybe it's 25%. <laughs> no, I, so... The answer from Miley is, if you have a company, you should have a company website, right? And, and the answer from a, a marketing perspective that I always give lawyers is, unless you have something that's very different, right? So I'll use one of our clients as an example. He does PI. He's also a hardcore biker, right? He has his biker site, and it does, it's great for motorcycle accidents, and he's all about being a biker on that site, which is great because he gets the right person. The rest of his site shouldn't look like that because it's a different audience. And if you're doing divorce and so foreclosure defense, fundamentally different. So you can make that argument. Search engines would say you really want to have one site. Um, having said that, so I have a client who will remain nameless who, when I engaged with him, he had 1,400 domains. 850 of them were live. Okay. And I was like, this is crazy. We consolidated down to 85. Okay, so we went from a whole bunch of different websites, we consolidated down to 85. And my goal was to bring him down to 8. But it didn't do anything. 
It didn't change his traffic. It didn't change if the phone call was ringing. So this is an example where clearly this is working. It shouldn't work. The, the theory tells me that it shouldn't work. But when we look at the data, it, it, it's countermanding what we are being told. And this is why, yes, question. In that instance, was he able to escape a manual? He didn't. I don't. This is. I don't get. So this is where this blows my mind. And this is part of the reason why I believe that the legal industry has a bit of a pass. No penalties. Garbage content vomited all over the place. This was not sophisticated. Like it was not. Everything I know tells me that he had created his own. No, Link no network. Yeah. Dude, you can find this. I know because so Google is a registrar, right? It's not that they have to look at these individual sites. They are a domain registrar. So don't ever forget that. So they know this. They have access to this data. That he owned all of these sites. It's not like he he did them through you know Indonesia or whatever. He owned all those sites. They were all registered under the same domain, and it worked. And you I know, hate it. Do you also? I'm trying to Google self interest. He also was a very big player for Google on PPC during this time. I would I would be crossing the line if I shared that. So maybe. But I, uh, having said that, I I don't believe that that's the case. I've okay. heard I've heard this argument many times, and I'll be honest, we tested. I've tested this with large spends in the past. Yeah. If we start spending, will this change our our search rankings? I have never seen a correlation. So I've heard the argument, but I I don't believe it. You've also heard that argument, Yo. I, I can't even go into it. What's your last name? It's Sam. It's S A A M. Spoken like the Bible, but um, pronounced it. So a lot of times people think I'm Arabic because I've got the two A's and I'm, I couldn't be like more white bread milk than, than I am. So one, one thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, Stephen's got a question there in the sidebar where he says, how do you feel about these budget PR agencies that charge a flat fee per month? Um, you're, if you're looking at PR agencies, this is what I think you should look at. Um, you want someone who understands the legal field, which cuts 99% of them out, and you also want someone to understand the value of a link. Um, and if you can have that intelligent conversation with them, great. Um, but, and let me hit this, what you're not looking for out of a PR agency is a bunch of press releases with anchor text. So if, just take that completely out of, of, of your, your, your brain. My take is most of you guys are going to have stories on an intermittent basis, if at all. And so what I would do is creatively look for those opportunities when it's like, you know what? Maybe my local newspaper is interested in this, and now I need to get to the local newspaper. That's a really good use of a PR agency. Putting someone on a retainer in the legal fields, I, we, we don't do it. Um, we, we respond to events and we respond to opportunities for our clients. I, I can't see that working. So I'm, you're, you're seeing my thought process work here, but I can't see that working in legal. What was your question? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I don't know that this is a big issue for most of the firms in here, but it might be for South, you know, for instance, where you've got PI and criminal defense. But, like, we've got some clients who are personal injury. They also do business litigation. Yeah. And also, you know, and the business clients don't have anything right. to do with the personal, you know, plan law firm. Yeah. So, you know, in that case, to me, it makes absolute sense to separate those into two separate sites. It, it, it does. And so th this is, I don't know that this is the right way, and I haven't looked at this from an SEO perspective. Um, if you're in a secondary city, there are, we have a bunch of clients that fit this profile. You're in a secondary city, you're in Spokane, you're not in Seattle. Um, it's okay to be the big firm that does everything, right? You've been around for 100 years, your grandfather's name's on the, on, on the building, and you, you, you handle pretty much the town's business. That works. I think that's appropriate. Um, if you're in a primary city um, and you have those clients who are very fundamentally different, 
it, it does make sense. Having said that, it is more than twice as expensive to market two sites than it is to market one. And it's probably three to four times as expensive. And when you think about the hardest, most expensive thing to do in this industry, it's to build links. And that means every time you have a link opportunity, you have to allocate where that goes. It, it's, a, it's a local disaster. So it's a pain in the neck. And, and, and you sort of crave because in one, you know, one sense you say, hey, you want that you know, major site with all the links, and then you see what's happening with newer sites without that many links, and you sort of like, now I'm going back to multi-sites. I know. And you know so we, we do work with some clients who have 10 to 12-ish sites, and they're very city-specific, and that, that I know can work, and it's kind of doesn't really bother me from a black hat perspective. Um, but it means they've got a market 10 to so the, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the 85 sites is too many. Yes. Conrad, do you want to comment to us about the difficulty or complexity of building links in this post algorithmic world? Quality links. So there's two things that we do. I have a list of places where you can get links from, and they're genuine links. And so Ava is a great example, right? Claim your Ava profile, you get a link from possibly the most authoritative site on legal. Do that. There's uh, 10 to 15 sites like that where you can get a link. If it's a good link, you're not buying links, listings. We do that for all of our clients. After that, it gets really difficult. It gets really difficult. And the ability to generate links is um, you're, you're dealing with very good content or you're dealing with PR opportunities. Those are the two things that I think about. And with the very good content, you're not dealing with, it's not about writing the content, right? This is what, like, the content is king, stuff is gone, right? You can write the best content in the world. You need to get that out there. And this is where social becomes, I've been, I poo on social all the time. This is where social can become really, really effective. But you need, and so having a marketing plan for your really good content with the hopes that it gets some links is actually re really important. Um, and it doesn't always work. It probably works like, I don't know, a third of the time. Um, but that's what you need to think about. And then thinking about things that are really genuinely going to get links. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I can't share that. Um, you, you have to get creative. You have to think about who you are outside of legal. If you are, a lot of you guys with, with large budgets are sponsoring things. Get links from that type of stuff. Get a find the local softball team and, and, and sponsor a team and make sure that the, all the other awesome stuff that you're doing you're getting recognized for. And sometimes it means a link and sometimes it doesn't. But thinking about these things holistically and thinking about your marketing from a holistic having an SEO department now is not a really good idea because they don't think about PR, they don't think about the sponsorship opportunities. We're working with a great uh, agents, a great law firm that does a ton of work with the medical community uh, for helping people in, in catastrophic um, accidents. These guys have a really great relationship with a bunch of doctors, kind of unheard of. Um, let's make sure that the web reflects that, and you, we have to find those opportunities. Well, we have all with our group, every single person in this room is a potential source of natural links. And Matt Katz is specifically stated that makes for people who can vouch for you and right. trust you. That's a natural link. There, yeah. So th there's th this is still the hardest thing, and when we get to a point where it's like, okay, client, we're doing every you're doing everything right. Your site's right, your tagging's right, everything's right. We gotta work on links. That's where I start seeing that that's where I get nervous, right? Because it just takes time and you're you're wrong sometimes. It just it, it's it's hard. It's an art. It really is an art. So how about local citations? Local, local, go crazy on local citations. Like, well, better look. That's the easy question. What I've found because every I come back from conferences, I'm like, gotta go with local links, right? Because that's, that's and you look and you know besides stuff that's extremely difficult to get, you're left with BS paid for national directories with local with a local <coughs> sort of page. Anything in between those that you seem to like as a direction to go. Local. So this is where local gets really um, creative, 
and it depends on what exists. Is there is there the page in like I live in this tiny little town outside of Seattle? Is there a page for the town? Is there a Better Business Bureau? Those those types of things like those citations take more time to get, but they're actually valuable. We we spend a tremendous we have been from quite some time and do to this very day tremendous amount of time and energy on local citations. Yeah. And from what you're just describing on different locations, and I can't tell you how important that is. It's so important. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. You have to do it year in and year out. The only way you'll have any effect. If you're in our field of law, which is the most competitive. So since it's the most competitive, don't expect anything to happen in a day. It is just a long grind. It's like a war of attrition to do well as a personal injury lawyer in your location. Yeah, it's just the way it is. Um, it's just the way it is. So, so the comments for anyone who, who didn't get that was was the 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 difficulty in local citations and the importance of having a an ongoing commitment to building those out because it's it's this doesn't go away. One of the things that I see is often I'll talk to a law firm who will tell me we didn't get hit by a pen, penguin penalty, but the phone stopped ringing. And what happens is they were very successful two or three years ago. And they're very successful. So why do we need to keep doing all this marketing stuff? And you'll see a slow and steady decline as this has gotten increasingly competitive. Any other any other questions? Let's see. All right. Eric's. I I'm I'm not sure. Oh, hold on. Let's see. No. No. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Conrad, for coming by. So, does anybody uh, have anything else they wanna they wanna add? I, I know we're still waiting for Eric. Andre, what uh, what are we looking at for his ETA? Should we take a break? Uh, what time? What time is it there, Mike? Uh, it is two twenty seven p.m. Vegas time. He said he's um, 5.30 Eastern time, which is 2.30 there. So I think he's about to come on. Okay. If you just if you just re-invite him, I think maybe. That's right now. I'm putting it in the chat box what? here. As well, so. Right now. Okay, okay, I'm just going ahead and re-invite him. Because yeah. when you give your talk in front of the Bar Association, um, you can I start see a question a here. Um, Really quick, I see a question here from Steve Sweat. How do you feel about the, uh, these budget we, PR agencies? We spoke about that already. Okay, sorry. I, I thought you did too, but all right. I've got to, I've got to agree with um, with what Conrad had to say about the Bing advertising, as well as what he had to say about attorneys' attitudes towards PPC. Um, you know, he summed it up perfectly. Though. Oftentimes we've had this this banter between you and I and Anthony and I and, and and all of us, is that a lot of attorneys approach it completely incorrectly. And um, I agree with you 100%, Conrad, with with what you had to say there. You know, they gone are the days when it comes to PPC of throwing money into it and just expecting whatever. I mean, those days are long gone. It's, it's been many years that they're gone. And unfortunately, many of the attorneys still have that attitude and think, okay, I'm going to spend 5000 bucks a month this, this month, and then I'll switch it off type of thing. They've got to change their mind shift, uh, their mindset, and, the, and, and, and look at it holistically and properly as opposed to just spending money on it. It's, it's about investment, a return on investment. That is what, that's the bottom line. It's not about spending money and getting ripped off by Google. If you're getting ripped off by Google, I'm going to say, first of all, fire your PPC consultant um, because they're not doing the right they're not doing the right things. And secondly, just get up to speed with what's happening in, in PPC and what and how much value it can actually bring you, whether it be at Google, Bing, or wherever. You know, it's got to be implemented correctly, tracked correctly, and and managed correctly. It's not a it's not a Chuck some money on the wall and see what sticks. Andre, just really quick, Eric Inga is sending me a text that he's here, but I don't see him here in, this, in the uh, he's, actual. He's, he's on the wrong, I think he's on the wrong link. Um, let me just write here, go here.
Eric. Um, there he is. All right. Okay, how's that? Awesome. Great seeing you, Eric. Yes. Uh, I hope the uh, connection will be okay. Um, I'm not in an ideal environment, but uh, we'll see how it goes. It's all right. I appreciate you coming. Uh, we're just uh, we're dragging. It's getting getting towards the end of the day, and I think we all. Partied a little bit too hard last night in Vegas, baby. I, you know, you're getting lots of sympathy from me. I'm sure I am. Um, you know, I, the only <laughs> thing I regret is that is that I that I uh, you know got hit by penguin so hard. Otherwise, I would have had you flown out here on first class Virgin Airlines. But uh, you know, maybe next time, huh? There you go. Exactly. We'll get it sorted okay. out. Well, um, you know, Anthony says we saved the best for last, but I think Mike Iwasaki might still be coming, but he's pretty good. But we'll just pretend like you're last because we know you're the best. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for, for such lofty praise. Yeah, thanks. You know, I, I think most of the people here know who Eric Inga is, but uh, Eric Inga, is, uh, he, he knows Matt Cutts, and he's pretty well connected, and he knows a lot about the Internet and how to rank sites. He's friends with Mike Blumenthal, um, you know, the Google local guy. So he's he's very connected. He knows his stuff, and uh, I'm really grateful that he's. He's got a that he, cool name for a company. Um, yeah, he's got a cool name for a company. <laughs> Stone Temple Marketing, awesome. And uh, I think he's doing some kind of an association with Mark Trapagan as well. So he's uh, you know he's connected with the right people. And anyways, Eric, I just wanted to go ahead and let you introduce yourself and um, go ahead and just talk away, man. Uh, uh, I'll I'll do that. Uh, so. Uh, yes, I am uh, Eric Inga, CEO of Stone Temple Consulting, uh, uh, author, or lead author, I should say, of The Art of SEO with Rand Fishkin and Stefan Spencer and Jesse Stricciola. And uh, I write in a few places, uh, Forbes, Search Engine Land, Search Engine Watch, uh, et cetera. And otherwise, I just try to have fun and uh, um, you know, keep myself uh, entertained along the way. Um, so what would be great to... Uh, uh, to know from you guys is if there's a particular area you'd like me to I'd be happy to take on uh, you know the topic of your choosing. You know, uh, does, does anybody here have any anything in particular that they want to address with Eric? I have I have one thing, Eric, uh, that I often wonder about. Uh, Google Publisher. How is that best used uh, to serve uh, website optimization? Uh, great question, and I'm not sure that I'm a great person to answer the question, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, the space is so complex, and there's so much different stuff out there that uh, it's really hard to, uh, to stay on top of it uh, um, uh, you know, all together. But I mean, basically, you're talking about the Google Publisher uh, uh, plugin. Is that right? Yes. Just you know, they, they got. We hear all about authorship ad nauseum. Uh, oh, okay. I see what you're talking about. Publisher uh, and how to actually implement that appropriately. I'm uh, sorry. I now understand what you mean. Understand it particularly. Yeah. Okay. So I I, I understand the question now. I, I was confused. There there is actually a toolbar that Google has called uh, Google Publisher, and I thought that's what you meant. But you're referring to rel equals publisher, which is a way of tagging your site so that uh, Google knows the content published on it is associated with you. Uh, so this is very uh, closely related with uh, authorship. The difference is that uh, authorship uses a tag called rel equals author, and authorship is specific to an individual, and authorship can be associated with an individual across a wide range of different sites. Uh, so, and Mark uh, Traphagen, who you had earlier, is uh, uh, considered... Uh, 
I'm pretty much the top expert to, uh, around on on, uh, uh, on authorship. But the way uh, rel equals publisher works is slightly different. It's associated with a website, uh, and it doesn't follow you around as you publish on other websites on the web. And the impl implementation is actually quite simple. You want to have a rel equals publisher tag only on the home page of your site, and it should point to your Google Plus brand page, not a personal profile. And then your brand page uh, should have a link back um, to, to your website. That's how you create the connection. And the two things together essentially cause Google to believe, OK, now these things are tightly tied together. Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, the, that's that's the mechanics. But what you get out of that, um, well, right now it's not clear you get a lot, other than Google can um, understand the connection between your website and your Google Plus profile. And if you've got a strong Google Plus profile, then some, maybe some of that authority will accrue to the benefit of the website. And if you've got content on your website that's getting a lot of great shares and things like that, and that can accrue to the benefit of your Google Plus uh, brand page. Um, uh, and so that's basically how that works. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, and, uh, you know, authorship's a little bit different, right? And uh, did you have Mark talk about authorship, or did you have him talk about something else? Uh, he talked about authorship somewhat. Yeah. Okay, um, because what I can do, if you like, and, uh, uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, content marketing as a discipline and how you can use that, uh, if you if you like, uh, or I can go down a, a panda or a penguin trail. You 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 tell like what what is uh, you know you have a bunch of uh, trial attorneys uh, who are marketing in, in competitive legal markets around the country. So I, I'm going to sort of, why don't we defer to you as far as, based on sort of the audience you have here, what you think would be most relevant for us? Sure. Happy to do that. So, um, and to that end, I, I do want to talk about content marketing because I think it's a great way to think about things. Um, I'm going to talk about it in general terms first. And then once we're done with that, then we have to back up and say, well, okay, uh, you just talked about something that sounds wonderful for a hundred million dollar corporation. Uh, what do I, as a trial attorney, do to make it work? And 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 I probably won't tailor the opening part to a hundred million dollar corporation, but I, I am going to sort of lay the groundwork for how this should work uh, for you, and then uh, and then we'll tailor it specifically to uh, your set of uh, circumstances. So along those lines, I'm actually going to show you. Uh, a couple of uh, um, slides, uh, so I'm going to do some screen shares for you. And so right here, uh, um, this is a, a screenshot of, uh, I've got to put it up so I know what I'm looking at. There we go. Or what you're looking at, I should say. Okay. So here's sort of the core element of a content marketing strategy. Uh, so imagine as a starting place that this blue box over on the left is a blog post on your own site where you've addressed some some uh, you know topic, and hopefully there's people who are readers on your site who are benefiting from uh, that uh, you know being there and they come to your site they see the article they like it and that's great. Um, but where it starts to become a little bit broader is when you've established some sort of social media presence and some visibility uh, in social media. Uh, and I'm, I am highlighting Google Plus here, but it can be, you know, Twitter, you know, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, uh, Instagram, whatever. Um, and the uh, uh, act of sharing the content in your social media is actually good for your social media, right? And I mean it's good for your social media because it's great content and you've taken care to make sure that the kinds of things you write about on the blog 
are similar to the kinds of things that uh, you tend to write about when you post, uh, uh, in this case, in your Google Plus profile. Um, and in addition, now you share in a Google Plus profile using this example, and that sends readers to the blog post, and, and some of those people are potential linkers, and that drives uh, you know, links uh, back to your content. So this basic synergy is kind of at the heart of what you're trying to create with content marketing, where these two things end up uh, uh, working together uh, for you. And that's the first stage. The second stage is where you go a little further uh, and you begin working relationships with influencers uh, and you know through those uh, building those relationships um, you create a situation where they tend from time to time to share your content as well when you publish it or they might just reshare your post your Google Plus post or your tweet or whatever um, and they act as an accelerant for the process, right? Because now it's not just your social media that is creating visibility, uh, um, you know, for the content and for you, but, but in this case, Susie Powers, we like to call her inside the company. Uh, Susie Powers is uh, helping you as well. Um, and so there's this whole process of building these relationships, which is very cool. Um, of course, it helps a lot if you, uh, um, you know, well, if Susie's area of interest is similar to yours, uh, it, it doesn't make sense for her, if she's focused on uh, Tupperware sales, uh, to share posts about personal injury law, you know, unless the personal injury was due to misuse of Tupperware. But they probably don't have a lot of those articles. Uh, uh, you'll have to tell me if you're able to write any of that kind of content. Um, and that's kind of the next stage of things is that uh, uh, Susie uh, uh, building these influencer relationships accelerates the whole process. Then you take it one step further, right? And now you have this notion of byline articles, what people typically call guest posts, okay? Um, uh, and guest posts add another layer, right? Because when you do a guest post on somebody else's site, and you, it's really important to shoot for authoritative sites here, by the way. It's not about a volume number of sites. It's about a very small number of sites that have large related audiences. If you're able to create content on those sites, um, uh, well, though that byline article typically has a link back to you. Uh, and you can, of course, also share that in your social media. Uh, and our friend Susie might uh, reshare that as well. Um, and now you're getting links to that byline article, which isn't on your site, but because the byline article has external links, not just the links from the publishing site, but from other places, that makes the links back to your site more valuable, right? Um, and that adds uh, sort of another layer that these things here that I've outlined are kind of the heart of a, a content marketing process. Um, and, you know, the kinds of things that you might want to, to set up for yourself. So I'll, I'll stop there uh, and see if you have questions about that and if, if all of that makes sense. No comments? Is this interesting or... I, I, I was just going to say, Eric, you're stealing my show. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's uh, uh, what you're what you're mentioning is just uh, really, really hitting home. Uh, just like excellent graph there. I love to see it in the graphical format that you just put up there. It looks fantastic, and uh, just absolutely makes sense. 110 percent. Awesome, and for our uh, our, our uh, attorney friends, uh, is this uh, uh, on, on the mark for you guys? Absolutely, awesome, excellent. So um, along those lines, um, there there are extra layers you can take into this process, and it starts to get more complicated 
you know, for uh, uh, you know something at the legal practice level. I'm just going to show you a couple of additional things that you can do, um, uh, uh, and just so you're aware of the concepts. But I do, you know, once I've, I've shown you a couple more slides, I want to back up and, uh, uh, and and really talk about how you can engage uh, uh, in all of this, right? Because you all have limited resources and you don't have an unlimited amount of time uh, to do this stuff. So here's kind of the next layer, right? Is you can just go out and create great content and share it on social media, do bylined articles, and build relationships with influencers. Ideally, you can take it another layer, and you get uh, and you do SEO research. Uh, and the reason why you do all this SEO research is, is that it informs how you approach the whole um, content marketing campaign. You know, what's the keywords that um, uh, you want to rank for and how do you tailor your uh, campaign to fit that? Um, what's your competition doing? Uh, what's the authority of, uh, of your site and your competitive sites? So here's an interesting one I want to highlight. In fact, it would be fun to uh, pull up uh, something here. Uh, so let me do that on the fly. Um, so um, I'm going to go to uh, Moz's tool, Open Site Explorer, and let me log in real quick. Is that showing on the screen for you while I'm logging in here? No, still your presentation is showing. There okay, so uh, okay, that's right. I have to. Uh, that's right. I have to change the screen share window. I'll do that in just a second. I want to show you the. Uh, okay, I'm just waiting. Ah, uh, there we go. Um, and. I'll back to the Hangout. Let me change screen share window. Here we go. Uh, oops. Yeah, well, that's just that. I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and where are you? Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, I have to open a new browser window because it's a uh, New window. There we go. The mechanics of sharing this stuff is a little funky. So there we go. I'll be able to do it now. So uh, all right, here we go. So um, here's a tool from. It's called Open Site Explorer uh, from. Um, Moz, they used to be known as SEO Moz long ago and far away. Uh, and uh, uh, what we're looking at here is I just took stonetemple.com and I punched it into Open Site Explorer. And you'll see two metrics here. It shows a domain authority of 63 and a page authority of 69. I've actually never looked at this in Moz. Those are actually pretty good numbers. I'm kind of happy with that. Um, but um, so these are just measurements that try to approximate how Google views authority of a, of a, a website and a web page. So according to this measurement, it says that, uh, hey, the domain authority of this site is 63. Well, if you think about it, um, uh, and if you understand the math of it, and I should probably just explain that, if I go back here, just screen sharing that. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that's uh, interesting here is, OK, if I'm going to go get bylined articles to my website, and I understand that domain authority is an approximation as to how Google likes your website, and I'm currently at a 63. What I can gather from that is getting a bunch of links from sites that are a domain authority of 40 is probably not going to help me very much. I actually want to target sites that have an equal or higher domain authority than what I have for my byline article efforts. 
And that's a very interesting thing to know because you can use this tool to figure out whether you're getting posts from the right kinds of sites when you, when you go out and do this kind of bylined article stuff. So that's, I think, a, a, an interesting and important concept of, okay, you don't just want to go out and do a bunch of stuff and hope it helps. You want to be able to put some analysis into it and actually be comfortable in knowing that it will help. So that's the uh, uh, very much the idea uh, of that kind of analysis. So um, now this all starts to sound like a fair amount of work. Um, uh, anybody uh, on the Hangout here have four hours a day to do content marketing? No. Yeah, sure. <laughs> No, we're too busy. <laughs> They're too busy partying in Vegas. Yeah, well, they're partying in Vegas. Yes, that uh, you know uh, uh, the challenges you have to face. You know, it's I just feel so bad for you guys. Um, but um, Eric, Eric, you were invited, buddy. You were invited, so you know, <laughs> try. Yes, indeed. Um, so, so the point is, and obviously you get it, which is. Okay, hey, this is great. Um, I'm glad you talked about all these things, Eric. I don't have four hours a day. Uh, I'm lucky if I have 30 minutes or a couple hours a week, and what do I do? Uh, and, and that's where the really interesting challenge comes in. And um, uh, honestly, uh, the most important thing to do when you have limited time and limited resources is to take that time and focus it in one area, maybe two areas, right? So maybe you pick one social media environment and you work that social media environment really hard, right? And you concentrate a lot of effort on that. So maybe it's Google Plus, for example, uh, where Michael uh, does a tremendous amount of stuff. And um, so, uh, you know, yeah, you go ahead and claim a profile for yourself on Twitter and you set up your company page on Facebook, but maybe they're just dormant and you're just claiming them because it's much better to do a really good job on one social network than to actually do a mediocre job on, uh, on many, right? You'll get far more benefit of that. In fact, uh, Mark Traphagen, uh, who was on earlier and uh, actually joined uh, Stone Temple Consulting as our senior director of online marketing um, in January of this year, which was awesome for us. Um, uh, he's a perfect example. He built his initial reputation um, by focusing on Google Plus, uh, and he's an enormous presence on Google Plus, and uh, it's a it was a fantastic strategy. He spent a ton of time there, and he went very very deep in one area, and it's really very much the right way to think about it when you have. Uh, limited time, as, as frankly we all do, right? Now, what you might do is you might do that for a while, you build visibility, you have lots of interactions, uh, and uh, uh, and by the way, it doesn't have to be Google+, it could be Twitter, it could be whatever else, right? Uh, as long as your audience is there. Um, and you build up that reputation and visibility and connections and all these things, get it all going for you. Then you get to the point where, okay, now I have this great presence, let me start publishing some articles on my own site, right, and, um, and share that with other people through my now powerful social presence, um, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, and then you get an impact. So you just build kind of a piece of the puzzle for yourself instead of trying to do it all. Of course, while you've been building that social media presence in the early stages, you of nature would have, of course, come across more influential people and hopefully built some trust with them. So you kind of have built in the influencer piece. So right now, even though we've been fairly concentrated and haven't tried to do a ton of stuff, um, you know, we've gotten ourselves a situation where we can effectively promote our uh, our content uh, and uh, um, and get links to our site, which 
you know, by the way, uh, I, I didn't include this in my uh, uh, presentation, but um, press releases can play a role here too. Uh, oh, someone's paying attention. Um, and I, I'll let Michael talk about that. But it's another way of reaching people, right, and a very good way of doing it. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, you can work that into the, into the mix as well. It kind of adds another way of reaching those potential media people that, you know, would uh, link to your content. So uh, I'm going to stop there and see uh, what questions we have and, and where you guys want to take the conversation. But that's well, kind of – go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, where I kind of wanted to take it, because we do have Mikey Wasaki with us, you know, him and I have been doing a lot of bantering. He's been doing a lot of research on the semantic web, and he's one of the owners of 24-7 press release, as I understand it. And he's been forming some relationships with, like, Associated Press and things like that. And, uh, you know, I just wanted you to stick around, and maybe you guys could even do some Q&A together, but um, uh, sort of address the, the lack of importance of a link at all. You know, semantically speaking, if I can get enough mentions of my name on a site, like, not necessarily 24-7, but if one of the distributors, like, AP picks up my article, and I get blasted onto AP with my brand name. I, I wanted to see how you felt about that because my thought is is more like Amerland that that's the future. But go well, ahead. yeah, no, I very much think it's a uh, uh, a future thing at this point. Um, in, in terms of brand mentions being a direct driver, that's my uh, personal point of view. But um, uh, it, it at, well it impacts local search for sure. By the way. So that's already on the table. Brand mentions do impact local search. Uh, so let me put that on the table to start. Um, not any real clear evidence that it uh, impacts uh, non-local search. So if you're trying to rank for, um, you know, San Diego uh, personal injury attorney, and you have a local listing and showing up in, you know, what we sometimes call the maps results in, in the Google results, um, and <coughs> there's lots of mentions of your firm, um, uh, that stuff uh, can impact those maps uh, or local listing type rankings. Um, the traditional uh, um, you know, web uh, blue links, as we call them, uh, uh, not so much of an impact uh, there at this time. Um, that can uh, and may well change over time. Um, I, I would not be surprised at all, um, uh, you know, if it changed over time. I mean, Google, the algorithms get more and more sophisticated in a lot of different ways. Uh, um, you know, there's a, a related concept is, does a nofollow link help you? Um, uh, well, it doesn't give you page rank, because that's what that instruction means, but that doesn't, doesn't mean that it doesn't help you. Right. Um, uh, Google may not be doing anything with that right now, uh, again. But I mean, ask yourself a question: If you're, if you have a Wikipedia page that someone has built for you and they haven't pulled it down, and uh, um, and you're mentioned there, and the link is no follow, you know, Wikipedia is pretty strict about what goes up on that site, and it's heavily curated and. And, and measured and monitored and everything else, you know, I would think that you know Google would want to count that. Now, the, the, the problem with this whole discussion is we don't know, right? Uh, and you know, Google doesn't really they're not going to let that kind of information slip. What, what's your take on the no follow now? Obviously, the Wikipedia example is given often. Um, are you saying for the future it's significant, or you think right now it's already significant? I think in the future that it, it could be treated, you know, effectively, uh, you know, based on the authority of the site where it's placed and the practices, the linking practices of that site, the nofollow could get ignored. So uh, not the link ignored, but the nofollow tag. So um, 
Uh, I, Eric, he's, he's asking you, Eric, as of right now, and I just wanted to point out that when, when Matt Cutts discussed Google Null, um, he mentioned that you know, Ju uh, Google could choose to ignore the Null follow if you're authoritative enough. Right. So based on the platform, it could happen. Now, it's going to be a little tougher. I mean, we used the Wikipedia example, but Wikipedia has one big flaw, uh, and that's it's a user-generated content site. And Google has real issues with all user-generated content sites, right? Um, so they're going to be very, very careful about anything they do with them. Wikipedia might be an exception just because of how closely monitored it, it, you know, it really is. And so it might raise to that level. But there are major media sites which have just decided they're no following every outbound link. They made that decision, right? Uh, so why wouldn't Google say, well, you know, shoot, uh, you know, that's the Washington Post. And by the way, the Washington Post hasn't made that decision, but let's just say they did. That's the Washington Post. And, the, you know, uh, we know how editorially tight they are. And, you know, if they link to something, it's for a legitimate reason, and I want to count that. Uh, and I could believe they, they would do that. I don't believe they do that today, right? Uh, I do think that's a, a, a future um, a thing that they might do. The, the thing to remember is that the search algorithms are so complex, right? Um, uh, it's two years ago now that Matt Cutts uh, told me that he knew, that Google knew about 100 trillion web pages. Two years ago, right? So you've got to figure they know about 500 trillion today. Um, that's just, I mean, it's a working guess, right? It's a lot of web pages, no matter how you score it. Um, and they crawl a goodly number of them. They do semantic analysis on all the ones they crawl. They build a link map for everything. They throw that into a database. And then a user from anywhere in the globe can enter any search query they want at all. And they get a response to four tenths of a second or less. Um, and uh, that's a very funky system, right? I mean, that's, uh, I, I like to argue that it's more complex than um, the software involved to uh, operate the space shuttle. And the, the overall technology of the space shuttle uh, is less significant than what it takes to operate Google. Um, and, um, uh, and so when you make changes to things, it has unintended consequences. And it happens all the time. We like to sit back and there's all these people who believe that we have author rank uh, working in a big way right now, and um, and uh, and it's a it's a great thing to talk about. It makes sense, right? Right? You know, gee, I have all this data on this author, and I know they're authoritative. I should just rank them higher. Um, but it turns out to be enormously complex to do that um, when you look at uh, uh, the uh, impact on the algorithm overall. So just to take the author rank example and run with it a little bit, um, there's, there's actually a small percentage of people who publish online who actually use uh, the authorship tagging, rel author tagging, right? Uh, and the, the impact of that is that um, if Google were to uh, try to lift the results of someone who was appropriately using tagging because they determined that they were, you know, pretty authoritative. They actually don't know whether they're lifting you over three other authors who are actually creating better content, right? So, um, so, so they don't do it. That's that's why we don't have author rank as a general. Uh, ranking algorithm today is is because the <coughs> signal isn't nearly broad enough. That's an example of an unintended consequence. I mean, other things happen. They they try algorithms and they see, well, shoot, eBay on average dropped three positions. Uh, you know, for most of their listings, we didn't mean that to happen. eBay is an incredibly important site. That's going to lower user satisfaction. We can't roll that thing out. And, it could be completely unrelated to eBay, what they tweet, and it has this consequence. And um, you know, it's just the nature of the the system that, that's uh, got so much complexity 
that it's very hard for them to introduce something new. And they do a tremendous amount of testing before they go. Sorry, that was a long ramble. Hi, Eric. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier about um, the time that's involved in creating all this content. And you know, so many of us know detailed uh, information about law in our practice areas. I see video as a way uh, to circumvent the, the time it takes to create written content. Uh, do you agree? And, and if so, what's a, what's a practical way to, to use video, for example, through YouTube or uh, on some other platform? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, and who was that? I was actually asking. I couldn't tell. Who, who asked the question? Okay, gotcha. Uh, well, uh, all right. I'll I'll go ahead and answer it. Uh, uh, but in any case, um, it's a great question. Um, so yes, video is a great way to go about doing things, uh, but you want to be careful. Uh, even though YouTube is the world's uh, uh, second or third largest search engine, depending on who you ask, uh, I think the correct answer is actually third um, uh, when you consider Bing is equal to Bing plus Yahoo. Uh, you, uh, YouTube is actually slightly behind that. But it's still a lot of search volumes. Like, great, I could have my video there, and that could work really well for me. Uh, but the problem is it's on YouTube, right? And while you can do certain things to try to drive traffic out of YouTube back to your site, where you can then try to get somebody to fill out a contact us form, it's a big jump for the user to do that. So the best way to really do that is um, go ahead and create your video. Uh, you know, uh, do your uh, talk about uh, whatever it is you want to talk about. Um, embed that in a blog post on your page with maybe a, um, uh, a 300 word summary of some of the most important points of the video, right? Uh, or maybe it's just 200 words, right? Uh, but, you know, something like that. Um, and then make that, which makes the article a lot easier to write, right? Because most of the content's in the video. Um, uh, and, and you're just sort of recapping it in, in the blog post part of it. You embed the YouTube video in there, and that's what you share. And now that you've done that, you can share share that in social media, and you know, tell people about it, and get people to come to your site. Um, and and you can have at the bottom of the post, or maybe on the right rail, uh, you know, the uh, um, you know uh, contact us link. And they don't have to go to from YouTube to your site. They don't have to take that big jump. And also YouTube, you know, basically to find the clickable link in YouTube is hard. It's easy on your site when it's in your own blog and on the right rail, boom, right there, contact us. You're going to have a much higher conversion rate and also any links that go to the page with the video on it is going to your site. So it accrues to the benefit of your site. And it's a great way to, to make things easier to do. Do you, um, there's a lot of Did that make people sense? playing around. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, question, right now it's a bit the wild west with YouTube and links, almost like it's 2011 again. Are you hearing anything about how Google's looking at that and whether they're, they're starting to do anything about that? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the, you said, came through a little Eric, Eric, what, he's, what he's getting at is that a lot of people are building caustic links to the YouTube videos and they're ranking number one. And he's wondering if, if you think Google's going to do something about that. Uh, I I I believe they will. Um, uh, it's uh, um, it, it's uh, a in competitive spaces. This stuff happens a lot um, uh, with uh, you know people uh, doing spammy kinds of things and uh, you know, using it to drive their rankings and accomplish uh, uh, you know kind of great things and and you know by doing it to YouTube they. Uh, um, are trying to leverage the, sort of the inherent strength of that platform to some degree. Um, I do believe that Google is going to try to do something about it. I think it's um, uh, it's really hard to tell when. Uh, I, I'll tell you, 
you know, I, I gave you sort of the whole rant about how complicated everything is. Um, it was only in 2012, on April 24th, 2012, with the release of the first pen, Penguin algorithm, that Google formally did something algorithmically to punish article directories, right? That was in 2012. I started talking about it must be imminent that Google would do something about this in 2008. It was obvious that they needed to do something about it. Uh, and it took four years before we saw anything. Um, uh, I'm hopeful that things will go faster now with some of these things. And there are some signs that things are going faster for Google. First of all, the Penguin algorithm itself was a, uh, a landmark for them, kind of giving them a platform to better address, uh, from an algorithmic level, bad link building practices. Um, uh, and then Hummingbird, which is much misunderstood, um, uh, is another major thing that happened that uh, might make this easier. So let me just briefly uh, uh, explain what Hummingbird is and isn't. Hummingbird isn't another algo like Panda or Penguin. Okay, Not that at all. Uh, uh, Hummingbird is a rewrite of the Google search platform. So it's much bigger and much broader than Panda and Penguin, which are just individual algorithms that address some specific kinds of things. Right? And when Google released Hummingbird, what happened is they, they did it in such a way where all the uh, old algorithms that they used for ranking and spam detection uh, were separated out and bolted into a platform. Here, I'll be the platform. Bolted into the platform, right? Uh, and that is, uh, so nobody saw major ranking changes or anything like that. So, you know, what's the big deal? Why is Hummingbird important? Well, it's important because the way they did it, they made it easier for themselves to bolt new kinds of algorithms on uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. So it's actually going to be easier for them to roll out new kinds of, uh, of things uh, intended to address certain kinds of problems. So this is all a very long-winded um, answer to a very simple question. Um, but what I'm trying to get at with the long-winded part of this answer is that I believe the pace at which Google can address things will accelerate, but it remains uncertain as to when they might address one specific thing or another. Did, did, did something happen last summer or um, uh, that I, mean, I, I just noticed that there was a big change in, in my ranking sometime around June of 2013. Is just, that just me, or was it something happened then? Well, it's all that spammy activity you were doing. Is that what it was? <laughs> <laughs> but soft, so, soft point. Uh, I, I'll, I'll get you an answer to that in just a second. Uh, so um, there's a great tool from uh, also from Moz. Um, where they have a, uh, a web page that shows, uh, uh, hopefully I did this in the right place, I did, um, algorithm updates over time. So what you can do, I'm going to put it on the screen right now. You see that? Is that showing for you guys? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to flip down to 2013, Small. and then on June 18th, there was a Panda algorithm uh, uh, released. Uh, there was a multi. Uh, there was a Panda dance on June 11. So if you saw a drop in ranking, uh, it may have been a Panda-related issue. This is a great thing to do if you see a traffic drop or, or traffic pop for your site. You can use this uh, tool from Moz. And how I found it is I just searched on the phrase Google Algo Updates. 
And the top result is this page, and you can go to it. And if you see something happen to your traffic in a big way on a given date, you can see if it matches up with the date that um, you had a uh, um, that, that Google made some algorithm change. So if you got hit, excuse me, uh, with a drop in June of 2013, if it was around the 11th, um, then that could be uh, why, right? Could be that you were tagged with a panda uh, type thing. I had two just clarifications on things you'd said today. One, you talked about bylines. Are you, is that, when you talked about the very beginning, are you suggesting, is that in a situation where you write an article and place it on somebody else's publication? Correct. So, um, uh, it, it's, uh, um, and it, there's a way to do it, too. So, I'm going to actually show you an example of, uh, of that. So, I'm going to go to, uh, if, if I can only learn to type, I'm going to go to an article that I wrote at uh, Copy Blogger just to show an example. Um, so let me get that into the screen share. And there you go. You should uh, you should have that uh, uh, visible right now. And I'm going to scroll uh, to the bottom of the article. Uh, oops, I'm doing that in the wrong place. Uh, okay, so. Um, just going to scroll through the article really quick. Uh, down here at the bottom, hopefully it's still in the screen share. Yeah, it is. Um, you see Eric, I'm the president of Stone Temple Consulting. Uh, you know, you can learn more on his blog, Twitter, or Google Plus. Right. So that's a byline. Um, notice how it's at the bottom of the article. I didn't go cramming a bunch of anchor text rich links in the middle of the article. You don't want to do that, um, uh, as uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that Google is looking to punish. Um, and you know, by the way, it can be very frustrating. You know, I'm giving you advice on how to do things, sort of the the uh, the, the white hat way. And meanwhile, around you, you're going to see people cheating and getting away with it, uh, and maybe even for you know what feels like long periods of time. Um, uh, and you know, we we strongly advise people to stay away from that kind of stuff, on the presumption that eventually the piper comes calling, uh, and you know, and will punish you for for that. But um, this is this is the way we do things with clients, and uh, and by the way, we get great results for them with just pure bylined articles, no rich anchor text, just helps them build their authority. Um, and, and it works great. So, so is the difference between a byline and guest blogging is grounded upon just the authority and relevance of the content in that space? Well, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, there's nothing wrong with the term guest blogging. Um, the, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it. Someone's going to abuse it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. um, uh, there's people who do guest blogging. Uh, and you know, it's a guest blog when I write on Forbes. That's a guest blog, and it's okay. You know, I mean, you can call it a guest post. Um, um, uh, it, it's it's an accurate label. Uh, so, uh, but the problem is that the overwhelming majority of things that were called guest posts have become spammy because of how people chose to do it. So. The only reason I use the term bylined articles is just to try to create some separation, but there is no real technical difference between the two terms. That makes sense. Um, uh, but we're just trying to use the term to communicate the idea. Hey, we're trying to do it right. You know, um, that that's really all there is to it. Uh, I have a couple of questions, please. Sure. Um, Eric, the first one is uh, those. I know it's proprietary information, but is there any way we could get a couple of copies of those um, schematics that you shared with us earlier, just as an overview for the um, guys? That